first announcement is about our men's breakfast. That is going to be on January the 7th at 8 a.m. Please uh, mark your calendars for that as we start the new year. That'll be a great way to start. My second announcement is about two sheets of paper that are on the two tables in the back. If you didn't get one coming in, please stop by on your way out. The first one is a Bible reading plan. Maybe you have one of those already and, and you know how you're going to prepare this year and, and read God's word. But if you don't, it would be a great way for us as a church to do it together. So pick that up. Uh, it's in the table in the back. And then also, you know, we talked a lot about loving God and loving our neighbor this past year. And so on the back table, there is a spiritual checkup question sheet that um, we did this week. And um, it just divides every all the questions in two areas. How am I loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? And then the second set of questions deal with how am I loving my neighbor? And so I would encourage you to get one of those. Maybe do that with your spouse. Maybe ask your children some of the questions. But it's a fun way to see where we're at spiritually. And then it has some questions to ask us, how are we going to go through the next year? And that's going to tie into some of the message today. So we are excited about today. Let us um, start with worship. Thank you, Chris. And uh, good morning and happy new year. Uh, so excited that you have chosen to start 2023 uh, with us here at Westside Baptist Church. And we're going to start with a banjo song this morning, okay? If you can stand with us, please do that as we uh, lean on the everlasting arm. Well, Happy New Year to everyone. So glad that you were able to join us for <laughs> worship and uh, excited about this morning. This month, now that it's January, it's January 1st, so this month is 10 years since I started here at Westside, which I, I didn't even realize it till Hayes told me. She said, you know, it's 10 years now. I said, no, I didn't, I didn't know that. 
uh, but it's flown by. Those, those two girls down there weren't even here uh, when Hayes and I started here at Westside. But that means 10 years ago, uh, I got to know Hal Lane, and he has been a mentor to me for 10 years. And so uh, I wanted him to be able to preach. He, he never really retired because he's continued serving uh, our church in any way that, that he could to be able to help the ministry here at Westside. So thankful that he's been willing and uh, grateful that he's going to share God's word with us this morning. There's a lot of wisdom in, I won't say how many years, but a few more than me. Uh, there's some wisdom for all of us to gain from uh, him and his faithful walk with uh, his Savior for these years. So <laughs> excited to have him uh, bring God's word to us. But we want to have a time of prayer, and it's New Year's Day. And so I want us to uh, be in prayer together for 2023 and, and pray God's guidance and blessing on this year. And so if you'll join me, let's have a time of prayer this morning. Father, as we close 2022, uh, regardless of, of what happened over the past year, uh, through those triumphs, through those victories, through those just times of, of blessing and Father, even through those difficult times over the last year, through the tragedies of the last year, through the losses of the last year, through all of those things, you proved faithful. And so Father, it's, it's standing on that faithfulness that we look forward to 2023, knowing that your presence is with us. So, Father, we pray that you will guide us as individuals in this new year. Guide the families represented here in the new year. Father, we pray for your guidance for our church in this new year. And, Father, as, as we seek your guidance, may we surrender ourselves here at the beginning of this new year. Father, may we be willing and able servants of you. So Father, whatever it is you have in store, those, that, that perfect plan and purpose and will for our lives in this new year, Father, make it so evident to us through your Holy Spirit. And Father, give us the courage, the boldness, the strength, the faith to follow uh, that perfect will and plan that you have for us. Father, we pray for your blessing over each family here this morning. And Father, we pray for that blessing, knowing that it will continue each and every day of 2023. So Father, we, uh, it's, it's your year. And so Father, we acknowledge that and we surrender ourselves to you for this new year, knowing that you have great plans for all of us. And Father, as we continue this time of worship, may you be honored. May you be glorified through the songs that, that are sung to you. And also as we open your word and, and study together, may you be glorified and honored through that as well. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you can, would you stand with us one more time as we sing together?
His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. You may be seated. Our children, second grade and under, are invited to leave at this time for their time of special worship. <coughs> Jesus talked about someone finding a treasure in a field, and then it was so valuable to go and sell everything that they had in order to obtain it. There's only one treasure that's worth everything that you have and everything that you are. That is Christ. And when you have Christ, you have all you need, all you'll ever need.
thank our pastor Kyle for giving me the opportunity to start the year off with you. It's been one of the joys of my life in ministry to see Kyle develop as uh, my associate for uh, five years and then become such an amazing senior pastor here at Westside Baptist Church. And Chris has been such a tremendous addition to our church and his family as well. We are blessed as a church to have this staff and I hope that uh, you realize that and and pray for them on a regular basis. Um, again, this morning, I want to just uh, tap into something that's interesting because the handouts that you have an opportunity to pick up today, there's one that has a kind of a spiritual evaluation on it, and then there's another one that is a read through the Bible program in a year. Both of them go exactly with my message, and we didn't coordinate that, so it's kind of a providential thing. So pretty excited to see that uh, God worked that out. This is a time of year, I think, when a lot of people are thinking about making changes in their life. Maybe you ate too much over the holidays. Uh, maybe you spent too much time on the couch watching football. And you're saying to yourself, you know, I really need to get in shape. I really need to make some changes in my life. Maybe I'll join the Y, or maybe I'll buy some exercise equipment, or maybe I'll get on a diet, or something else that you want to do positively in your life. And that's great. That's, that's important. And uh, the Apostle Paul actually used the importance of physical training and getting in shape physically as a comparison to the more important need to get in shape spiritually. And so as we think about getting in shape physically for the new year, I hope that we'll be thinking about getting in shape spiritually for the new year as well. Sports were not really big in Hebrew culture. Uh, if you look in the Old Testament, most of the physical training would have been for young men preparing to enter the army and to serve in a military way. But in Hellenistic culture, in the Greek culture, sports were huge, just like they are in our time. You think about in America today, what's the biggest areas for gathering that are built in America today? It's for sports. And uh, it was the same way in Greek culture uh, in the first century AD. Uh, they had five major Greek games. All of you are familiar with the Olympics. But the second one that was uh, next to importance was called the Isthmian Games, I-S-T-H-M-I-A-N. And Isthmus is a narrow piece of land that connects two larger bodies of land. And that's what Greece is, is if you look at it on the map. You have the larger body to the, to the north, then you have this little Isthmus that connects the Peloponnesus, or the bottom part of Greece as well, and that's where the city of Corinth was located. And so that's where the Isthmian Games were held. And so the Apostle Paul, I don't know whether he attended the games or not. A lot of the Jews did not because the, all of the Greek games were dedicated to gods uh, in the mythology of the Greek pantheon. But uh, at least if he didn't attend them, he knew a lot of the people that he was writing to in the church at Corinth were. So I want you to look with me at a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 through 27 first. Everyone who competes in the games, and the Greek word for uh, the verb for competing in the games is agonizomai, from which we get our word agony. <laughs> So it'll give you an idea of how strenuous these games were and how difficult it was to train for them, just like in modern day training as well. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control, Paul said, in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. Now the great prize at the Isthmian Games, if you won, was a withered piece of celery, celery that was woven into a wreath that they would put on your head. So Paul was saying, these people worked so hard <laughs> for a piece of withered celery. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable, 
Paul says we're in a contest too. We have the need to train as well. We need to succeed as well. And our victory will bring about something far better than the perishable prizes of this world. Therefore, he says, and here you see some of the types of activities that were involved in the early games. Therefore, I run in such a way, running was a real big part of the uh, games at this particular time. I run in such a way as not without aim. In other words, I'm not just running all over the place. I'm, I'm running the course. I'm, I'm running the track. I'm finding my way, hopefully, to be the first one to cross the goal. He says, I box. Boxing was also big. Boxing and wrestling and a lot of physical things uh, were involved in these early games. Therefore, I box in such a way as not beating the air. So Paul is saying, you know, I'm not pulling my punches or I'm, I'm not just throwing punches and, and not directing them where they should, should be. It's very purposeful, he says. He says, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So this is a training metaphor that Paul used that a lot of the people in his time would understand. Let's look at a second one that he uses, and this time with his young protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, beginning with the second half of verse 7. Uh, Timothy is in Ephesus, a different city, and uh, he is being left there to lead the congregation as Paul goes on about his missionary journeys and so forth. But Timothy, uh, he says this to him. On the other hand, he says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is of only little profit. That's again for the reasons that we talked about before, because it only applies to this life and the prices that this life can afford. However, but godliness, he says, is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, in the first century AD, the rabbis, uh, even in Judaism, talked about two spheres of existence. They talked about ha'olam hazeh, which is this life, and ha'olam haba, which is the life to come. And so what Paul is saying from his rabbinic background here is basically this. Physical training has uh, benefit for this life, but spiritual discipline and training has benefit for this life and the life to come. All right, so let's see where we're going this morning. I always like to tell you where we're going so that you can follow with me in this study. First of all, we want to understand what Paul meant by spiritual discipline. We know about physical discipline probably, but what does it mean to be spiritually disciplined? To suggest ways that we can train spiritually. I'm going to give you some very practical things that can be done. And then we want to commit ourselves this morning to becoming spiritually fit. Let's talk about physical training. I like working out. Uh, some of you here today see me at the Y on a regular basis. Uh, I'm a very active tennis player as well, and more recently pickleball some as well. Uh, I love competing. I love uh, trying to do things to uh, improve and so forth. Kyle wouldn't tell you, but I'm 70 years old. So uh, I, uh, I have a few years under my, my belt. So uh, it's important even as you get older uh, to be uh, as physically fit as you possibly can, I think. Uh, physical training, first of all, requires discipline. Uh, a lot of mornings I get up and I say, I'm not sure I want to go to the Y <laughs> and lift those weights and pull those machines and do the things that are necessary there. Uh, and just like in physical training, we're going to find that spiritual training requires effort as well. Secondly, it improves your health. Physical training is good. I'm, I'm not here today to tell you not to regard that as important. It's, it's important for you, no matter what age you are, no matter what you're engaged in, in terms of your occupation or lifestyle or anything like that. Uh, it's good for your health. It's one of the things through the pandemic that a lot of people didn't want to talk about, the fact that exercise is important in, in terms of fighting these diseases that seem to be coming to us from all directions. It increases strength and endurance. The only way for you to get stronger is to have resistance. And uh, in weight training or in machines or in whatever it is, you've got to push yourself in order to get the strength and endurance. And these are two qualities that are important in the Christian life as well then you just feel better. You do. Now, 
I was never one that got that high. Uh, in high school, I started running a mile every day. I just decided I needed to, to get more exercise. And so I went out and, and I was always waiting for that, those endorphins to kick in and for me to have that high that a lot of runners have. I never got it. Um, I'm still waiting for it, but I don't run, I don't run like that anymore except on the tennis court. But it, it, it does. After you've gone through the pain and you've gone through whatever training you're doing, you do feel better. And uh, it is important physically. And it improves the quality of your life. It really does. And it could possibly lengthen your life. Now, there's some things that can attack you even if you're physically fit, but there are other things that you can avoid if you are. So let's talk about spiritual training. We see some of the benefits of physical training. What about spiritual training? Well, first of all, it results in spiritual growth. Uh, physical training doesn't help you grow spiritually. Only spiritual training does. Second of all, most importantly, it pleases God. This is something that when you do, God is going to be pleased with you, and that brings the blessings of God's uh, pleasure. Thirdly, it strengthens relationships in, in your family. It strengthens relationships in your work situation. It, it strengthens relationships in every area of life, which is important. It, it results in effective ministry. This is why Paul was telling Timothy, you need to discipline yourself and become spiritually strong because it will enable you to be able to do things that uh, you couldn't have done before. So the more physically fit you become, the more effective you become in ministry. And then it obtains eternal reward. That's why he means it's important in this life and in the life to come. So let's look at the spiritual workout, okay? And the first thing is kind of negative. This would be like in physical training, kind of like the diet, where you, you get on the diet and you have to deny yourself certain things. Well, this is going to be talking about deny the flesh. Uh, the word flesh is used uh, a lot of different ways in the Bible. Sometimes it's used of just flesh and blood, uh, body of the existence in this life and so forth. But Paul has a very special use for the flesh in certain contexts. For Paul, in these contexts, Paul used it sometimes to refer to what we might call the sinful nature within us. This is the nature that we are born with because we are descendants of Adam, because of original sin, because of the depravity that has come upon humanity because of his sin. This is the nature that we are born with. It is the controlling nature of all people who are lost, according to the Bible. It demands satisfaction of the appetites of the human body. And we're certainly living in a culture now, are we not, where people are encouraged to pursue whatever they want, whatever they feel like, whatever they think is normal, whatever they think is natural, whatever they think is pleasurable, whatever relationships they want to establish, all of this is good and, and good because it comes from within them. They don't realize that what's within us is not good. <laughs> yeah, what within us is the flesh, according to Paul and, and the Bible. It desires to do what is evil. And it is opposed to the laws of God. And this is why we get a lot of persecution today and why Christians are often the targets uh, by people in our society today. It is because we are not approving of a lot of things that they want approval for. And we are not tolerant in the sense that they want tolerance in terms of approving what they're doing. And again, if, if you just look at this, this explains so much of what's happening in our world today and in our culture today. The, the lost people, and some Christians, unfortunately, have made the flesh the standard for what is right. Whatever you want, whatever comes from your heart, whatever desire you have, it's normal, it's natural. No, the Bible says there are natural desires and unnatural desires. There are things which are right according to what God intended for us to do when he created us, and there are things that are wrong for us that we should not do as he created us. And the Bible differentiates those things according to the laws of God. And so what Paul says, you've got to learn what the laws of God are. And when you feel those desires within, you have to resist the sinful flesh. So here's what he says in Romans 6, uh, verses 11 through 13. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you may obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of, right, of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Look at this passage, Romans 13. The night is almost gone 
and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. So that's the first part of, of this, denying the flesh. Now, in order to do that, it starts with the mind. So let's look at controlling the mind for just a moment. First of all, you need to understand that the origin of every sin that you and I will ever commit is right here. It's in our thought process. We need to acknowledge evil thoughts as sinful. A lot of people think, well, I didn't really do anything. I just thought it. Well, Jesus said, you know, if you have lust in your heart, it's sin. If you have hatred in your heart, it's like murder. He says, thoughts count in terms of spirituality. Secondly, do not expose the mind to sinful temptations. Oh, my goodness. Are we not living in a world today where all of our young people and so many adults are being exposed to things that are sinful, things that are tempting? We've never had a more open opportunity for people to tap in to sinful things than we have today. Thirdly, do not dwell on sinful thoughts. They're going to come along. Temptations are going to come along, but you don't dwell on them. You don't let them live there in your head. Ask God to enable you to turn away from sinful ways of thinking. The only way you'll be able to do that is with God's help. And then you want to confess your sin when you do sin and ask God's forgiveness. It's important to avoid these things. Bad company. Bad company corrupts good, good morals. That's why young people, your parents are so concerned about who you're hanging out with or who you're with online or uh, who you're associating with because who you associate with will influence your life, positively or negatively. Avoid justifications for sinful choices and excuses. These are some, justifications are sometimes what you think about before you commit the sin and go ahead and do it. Excuses are more what you've done after you've committed the sin and you just want to say, well, it wasn't really that bad. And then what you want to avoid is what I call the cycle of sin. I want to show you this graph, and as far as I know, I did this. I, I haven't seen it anywhere else. But this, I, I, in ministry, I dealt with people with addictions of various kinds through the years. And if you've ever dealt with an addiction personally on your own personal level, a family member or whatever, this is exactly what you'll find is what an addiction is like. First of all, you get a temptation to do something, okay? And then you commit the sin. And then after you've satisfied yourself with the sin, you have remorse. And then you're feeling bad about it. And you think, well, I need to change, and I don't need to do that anymore. So you make a promise to change. And then you get tempted again. And that cycle goes like that, on and on and on. And again, it could be a substance addiction, it could be a sexual addiction, it could be all kinds of addiction, whatever it is. But that cycle, if you don't get out of that cycle, if you don't get out of that cycle, it will destroy your life and your ministry. So the goals of spiritual training are to resist sinful thoughts, eliminate sinful speech, James says, you're perfect. We're going to be having a study in James pretty soon. You're perfect if you learn to control your speech. And we want to cease habits or activities that feed the sinful nature. Now, let's look at the positive side very quickly, okay? We want to put on the new nature. We don't want the flesh to be controlling us, but we do want the new nature. That's why you needed Christ, by the way. You needed to be transformed. You needed to be changed. You needed to get a new nature. You couldn't live according to God's will with the old nature, so you didn't need a new one. So here we are, Ephesians 4. Here's what Paul says. That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, that's the flesh, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So you've got a new nature that you can live according to. You don't have to live according to the old nature anymore. It was promised, prophesied in the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart uh, give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Now, if you physically want to really get serious about, you might want a personal trainer. And David Walton is one of the personal trainers at the Y. So you can enlist him for a fee to be to be your personal trainer. Hey, you can enlist me. I'll be your personal trainer for a fee. Just, just kidding. No, not really. 
but you need a personal trainer. And, and, and I've seen the personal trainers working with them there. You know, they're in there. It's not like the Peloton. Come on, you got to go, got to go, got to go. Gotta, you know, you know. Kinda. But, 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 they, but they're pushing you. They're saying, you know, you can do more, you can do more. More reps, more reps, more reps, more reps. Okay, rest a little bit and we're going to do this. Because they know how to build you uh, and, and how to push you beyond your limits, okay? Well, we have a personal trainer in the spiritual disciplines as well. And it's not a person. It is the Holy Spirit. I have many more things to say to you, Jesus said, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into the truth. And he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. So Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us to be our personal trainer. He's going to guide us into spiritual truth and he's going to give us the kind of uh, leadership day by day that we need. The second thing in physical training is that you need to eat properly. And I'm not so good at this, okay? So don't use me as an example in this. I still eat like I was in college, okay? But it is important to have the right food. And spiritually, it is important as well. And of course, the Word of God is our spiritual food. So again, Peter said, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So... The Word of God is very important in terms of being able to grow spiritually. Here's uh, some principles for digesting the Word. These are good for physical food and <laughs> for spiritual food as well. First of all, eat regularly. Okay, they will tell you that's, that's uh, important. Eat slowly. Don't just rush through. I've got a Bible passage to read today. And then you don't really know what you read after you've read it. Uh, digest what you eat. Okay, meditate on it. Think about it. What does it mean? How does it apply to me? And then eat the whole thing. <laughs> the Bible is not like uh, a cafeteria where you get to go and pick whatever you want and leave whatever you don't, okay? So again, eat the whole thing. And we've got read through the Bible sheets here in the back so that you can read the whole thing in a year if you have never done that or even if you have done that before. All right. Use the word as a mirror. We're going to see this comes directly from Scripture. If you go into the why, one of the things you'll notice, first of all, is there are mirrors everywhere. You can't look around and not see yourself, okay? That's either good or bad. <laughs> you know, some, some of the uh, people in the weight room, they like that a lot. Some of the rest of us would just as soon not have as many mirrors. But anyway, the word of God is a magic mirror. It's a magic mirror because if you look in a regular mirror, all you see is what you are, and it can't do anything except reflect what you are. The Word of God is a kind of mirror that if you look into it, it will not only show you what you're like, but it will change you. Yeah. Reflect on what you are. Reflect on what God's Word says you should be, your goal, and then make changes to conform to God's will. All right, let's look at the passage that talks about that in the book of James. And again, uh, long before Nike had this uh, as their slogan, uh, this was from James. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. All right, guys, you can relate to this, can't you? Have you ever cut your chef shaving? And you say, well, I've got to stop it so you don't have any special things, so you get toilet paper, right? Yeah. And you stick the toilet paper on there so you stop the bleeding. And then you, forgot to look, you, get, you forget to look in the mirror again, so you go out and you've got a piece of toilet paper stuck on your face. And only a nice person will say, hey, you have a piece of toilet paper on your face. <laughs> well, that, it's like a lot of people sometimes when they read the Word of God, they see the things that need to be changed, but they don't take the toilet paper off. They don't they don't change. And James says we need to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. He says, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Okay. Now, you can exercise at home. I know everybody can't afford to be a part of a health club or things like that, but the thing is, it Spiritually, you do need to be a part of a club. And the club is the church, okay? 
you need a spiritual health club, according to the author of Hebrews. By the way, the author of Hebrews is the only other uh, New Testament writer that uses a sports analogy, by the way. Uh, talking about people standing in the stands as you are out there competing and uh, giving your best because of those who've gone before you who've succeeded. But the author of Hebrews says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together. That's what we're doing here today. We're assembling together. As is the habit of some. Some of, even in the early church, had become people who thought, I don't really need church. I don't need to be a part of a fellowship. I don't need to get up and go to church. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we need to be together. We need to encourage one another. We need to help each other as we move forward. All right, exercise. <laughs> That's always important of getting in shape. So here's some spiritual things you need to do. First of all, exercise your spiritual gifts. That survey will kind of help you think about what your spiritual gifts happen to be so that you can plug in and use them. Spiritual gifts are never given for your own personal benefit. They're always given to you so that you can help somebody else. Secondly, stretch your faith. Um, stretching is important. I always stretch before I play tennis uh, or anything like that because I know I'll get injured if I don't. Well, stretching your faith is like, hey, I'm going to go on a mission trip. I've never been on a mission trip before. I'm going to witness to somebody I haven't shared Christ with before. Uh, I'm going to start a new, new Bible study. I'm going to start a new time of meeting with some people that I haven't met with before for spiritual encouragement. Whatever it is, you need to stretch your faith in whatever ways that you have in your life that you can do that. Thirdly, the Bible talks about walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit simply means that we are walking according to the will of the Holy Spirit for our lives, according to the Word of God. Then, run the race that God has prepared for you. When Paul comes to the end of his life in 2 Timothy and talks to, uh, to young Timothy, he says, you know, I've, I've run the race. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. I made it. And there's a there's a goal for all of us to make in our Christian lives. And then, yeah, you got to fight. <laughs> Not each other, <laughs> but fight the devil. Fight against the influence of the world and fight against the flesh within you. Well, we're done. I just want to ask you a couple questions and we are, are finished. First of all, only you can answer this. Are you spiritually fit? You know, sometimes we can look at people, sometimes not, tell whether they're physically fit or not, but you can't tell by simply looking at somebody if they're spiritually fit or not. So only you know that. Secondly, are you growing spiritually? Is this progress in your life? Are you see that strength and that ability and that ministry and that faith growing in your life? Thirdly, do you have a plan for your spiritual growth in the coming year? Are you denying the sinful nature? Are you strengthening the new nature within you? And what are your spiritual goals? If you were to think about what you want to be next year this time, what are the goals that you would like to see achieved in your life or in your influence and leadership of others? Father, we're grateful today for the privilege that we have to be in your house and to know that spiritual training has value for this life and also the life to come. So grateful, Father, for the truths of your word which guide us and direct us in a world that has lost all bearings and has lost all uh, uh, sense of desire to please you and to know you, Father. We know that we must depend on the Word of God to guide us rather than the influence and the teaching of this world. And so, Father, I pray for all of our young people here today. I pray for our young families. I pray for those who are uh, in the middle age of life. I pray for those who are seniors, Father. All of us are in danger from spiritual falls. All of us are in danger and in need of your guidance and protection. All of us are in need of spiritual growth and becoming even more effective. Father, we know you've left us here in this life 
not just to be stagnant and to hold the line, but you want us to constantly be pushing forward, always constantly moving forward in our faith and in our service to you so that when we come before you, you will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we're grateful today for the privilege we have to be in your house and to be in this great church. And we're so thankful for all you're doing in our church in these days. And I pray your blessings upon those who may need to make decisions today here or in the privacy of their time later today with you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Your pastor will be down here to talk to you if you would like to talk with him about something that's going on in your life right now. We invite you to stand as we sing a familiar tune but with new words. Thank you for being here this morning, and thank you, Hal, for uh, sharing God's Word with us this morning. Don't forget, I know it's been mentioned, but there are two pieces of paper as you leave on the tables at each exit, and uh, I, I take that, and you as an individual or you as a family go through those questions uh, together as a time of spiritual survey, and I would love for us uh, to read God's Word together this year. And so if you don't already have a Bible reading plan, then grab one of those as well. But again, thank you for being here this morning. Ernie, fresh off a Tennessee win, I know you're feeling good this morning. Will you, will you say a word of prayer for us as we dismiss? <laughs> 